Hello, everyone. This is Kristen Huber, and on behalf of One Neck IT Solutions and 451 Research, which is now part of S&P Global Market Intelligence, I would like to welcome you and say thank you for attending today's webcast titled, Critical Steps to Secure a Remote Workforce. Leading off today's discussion will be Scott Crawford, who is Research Director of the Information Security Practice at 451 Research. Joining Scott will be Katie McCullough, who is CISO of One Neck IT Solutions. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, simply type it in the question box on your screen. We'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A session. The presentation slides are available for download in the resources section in the console as well. And finally, the on-demand version of the webcast will be available for download once the live webcast concludes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Kristen, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes happen fairly dramatically, fairly quickly, uh, not just in IT, but across virtually every organization over the last three to four months uh, with the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, this, in turn, has driven a tremendous uh, increase in remote work and working from home, as most everyone on this call is going to be fully aware today. And we want to take a look at one of the most significant aspects of that move to working from home, and that's its implications for security. Uh, to do so, we're going to have to take a look at where uh, not only security, but where IT has uh, been over the last few years, how it's evolved in recent years, because that uh, has a direct impact on the way that organizations have had to respond to the impact of uh, COVID-19. So we'll take a look at that evolution and part of its implications for security. Uh, part of uh, that evolution has implications for security, and we'll take a look at some of those in some detail. We'll look in particular at some key points of focus for security. And in particular, we'll take a look at the service provider's point of view, how service providers can really help organizations navigate through these changes, resources that they can make available to organizations who may have a lot of questions about the right decisions to make, right directions to go, to do the best job of responding uh, in, in a combination of response to what's happening in the short run and making wise investments that will best prepare them for where they need to go in the future for whatever normal does look like uh, coming out of this episode. We'll wrap with a few minutes for Q&A. So if you've got any questions for us, feel free to drop them in the Q&A window that you'll see as part of the webinar. We'll get to those at the end of the webcast, and uh, Katie and I will uh, join up together in answering your questions for you as best we can. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and take a look at where we've come from and how uh, IT has put us in a, uh, the position that we are today uh, to have the necessity of responding the way that we do uh, to the outbreak of COVID-19. And a good deal of that has had to do with the evolution of IT away from this concept that many of us uh, came into the field with and have been familiar with for a long time, and that's the, the concept of IT being effectively homegrown, meaning that each organization ran a fairly contained IT organization, uh, a number of endpoints distributed through the environment, but typically within the traditional enterprise facility, traditional enterprise buildings, uh, distributed networks uh, set up and deployed on premises with people working in offices and still very predominant, of course, uh, a work factor for many organizations. But this network being entirely on premises and even when uh, individuals were able to bring in their own devices, personal devices, uh, the business would typically provide uh, corporate endpoints and still do no matter where uh, people connect from or work from. Uh, but typically connecting on the enterprise network in traditional facilities in the brick and mortar buildings owned and operated by the enterprise itself. Using the enterprise's own network, uh, which it uh, distributes and deploys, manages, maintains, maintains connectivity, architecture, deployment, and connecting to centralized resources that had historically been served from uh, the organization's own data center or data centers for a large organization. They, those may be distributed geographically sometimes around the world, but still essentially owned and operated by the business itself. And then we have seen in the last, uh, over the last couple of decades actually, the beginning of uh, expansion to service providers in terms of IT services, so typically those have been hosting services, co-location, web, uh, web hosting providers, those who would provide um, IT resources for centralized IT and even outsourcing data center operations themselves. 
But as we saw the growth of technologies that began generally around concepts of virtualization, we saw those who provided these uh, centralized uh, service, uh, services being uh, shifting towards more uh, a more efficient model that we now today come to associate with the cloud or cloud native infrastructure as a service, the ability to allocate uh, the availability of computing resource on demand that's leased from the provider, which frees businesses from having to make the capital investment as well as the maintenance and expertise to deploy and maintain their own IT. Cloud providers taking advantage of, of technologies, beginning with virtualization, able to vastly multiply both their availability and their ability to deploy these resources on behalf of their customers, and turning cloud computing into, to say the least, a very substantial business to the point where today the evolution of these technologies now makes cloud computing a very significant aspect of most businesses. In fact, if we look at the combination of a variety of the varieties of deployment models of both cloud and SaaS based cloud delivered services in general, we've seen a tremendous multiplication not only in these services but in their availability around the world to the extent that for many organizations, these third party resources delivered from the cloud have become a really substantial, if not most, of how centralized IT is delivered, deployed, and operated for many of these businesses. But we still have a profusion of distributed sites for many larger organizations. We still have a large number of people using mobile computing, mobile devices. Uh, over the last decade and a half, we have seen a tremendous uptake of personal devices and cell phones that have become increasingly capable, which we used to think of as smartphones, and now we just think of them as, as everyday phones, what everyone has in their pocket. Uh, the ability to connect remotely has been vastly expanded by the availability and performance of distributed networks extending even into the home. Uh, the, in fact, the availability of networking in the home far beyond what we could have gotten into the enterprise just a few short years ago. And in businesses, we're seeing a great profusion in all kinds of integrations of computing with operational technologies and this evolution of so-called smart technologies that are increasingly characterizing not only the consumer in the home environment, but definitely in the enterprise and definitely in industry, smart manufacturing technologies, medical and healthcare technologies that are increasingly capable and increasingly connected. Um, transportation, where an aircraft or even an automobile may not be even just you know one or two individual uh, computing systems, but they themselves are effectively data centers on wheels almost because of the sheer number of computing devices and, and connectivity that they have in any one aircraft or train or truck or an automobile. So this tremendous profusion that we're, we've seen in the number of endpoints, uh, not just in the consumer space, but in the enterprise and throughout the world has really taken over uh, in many industries a great deal of attention and a great deal of budget as organizations look to adopt these technologies to expand what they're capable of doing. In fact, when we look at the growth, the types of endpoints that we see being connected with so-called smart technologies, operational, industrial control technologies, just in the enterprise alone, not including the consumer technologies in, in uh, smart home, smart TV, uh, and so on, we see it, we expect in the enterprise here at 451 Research an estimation of roughly 8 billion of those devices now growing to nearly double almost 14 billion by the year 2024. So that's a pretty significant growth just in the number of endpoints that we expect to see in the enterprise, compounding the situation with the sheer number of uh, cloud and third party SaaS services that we see growing and recharacterizing the nature of IT. And then in the last couple of months, we have, we have had to deal with this sudden shift in demand on technology on account of the outbreak of the coronavirus and the spread of COVID-19. Here at 451 Research, we uh, surveyed a number of hundreds of organizations around the world. We uh, asked them about how the COVID-19 pandemic was affecting them, and in particular, how it was affecting their investment in IT and in IT security. And one of the things that uh, really stood out of this survey is when we first, when, when we surveyed the first group in March, a little over a third 
respondents told us that they expected working from home and remote work on account of COVID-19 to be long-term or even permanent. Um, 65% had already made some, can, uh, made some investment to uh, adapt to the changes required by coronavirus, but a third of them expected those changes to be long-term or permanent. But we just surveyed uh, another approximately 600 or so respondents, uh, and uh, that survey was just published uh, this past week, and we saw the number of those expecting the changes to be long-term or, long-term or permanent double in terms of percentage. Where in March it was a little over a third, now it is two-thirds of respondents expect these changes to be long-term or permanent. So that means that we're looking at a situation now where not only have we significantly increased the number of cloud and SaaS services that we're using, and that number has been further amplified by the number of services that we have to call upon to enable not only working from home, but collaboration from home and cooperative work from home. And the type of work that we were able to do in offices, getting together face-to-face, working together physically, we now have to do from virtual collaboration systems and content sharing. And we've increasingly turned to third-party service providers to provide those technology services. But at the same time, we've had not only this growing expansion in the number of endpoints and the number and variety of types of endpoints, and growing connectivity enabled by trends like the increase in 5G networking, for example. But millions of people now working outside of the traditional office environment, connecting from home and remote networks. And we have this very constrained looking IT environment where still we have a lot of this remote connectivity still brought back through this legacy enterprise network concept, being brought back through VPN in order primarily to take uh, advantage of the security functionality deployed in this traditional enterprise environment. But we're still relying on threat prevention, policy enforcement, monitoring and response deployed within this traditional environment, regardless of the fact that we not only have millions more people connecting remotely, but these people could be connecting directly to third-party SaaS and cloud services that are also off-premises outside this traditional network environment. Are we going to continue to expect that we're going to have to bring all that traffic back through this legacy network concept when these remote endpoints could just as easily connect directly to these highly available third-party cloud and SaaS services? What about those endpoints? Why wouldn't they connect directly to those third-party resources if their security can be assured, if the enterprise can be connected, if policy can be protected, and policy priorities can be uh, assured by the business in combination and in concert with those providers. Because organizations have had to rely on these legacy concepts like VPN and their availability and the sudden uh, demand on these third-party services that has put strain on those providers as well, Organizations tell us in both of the surveys that we conducted in response to the coronavirus outbreak in March and June that the strain on IT IT has been considerably greater uh, than they would have anticipated. 41% told us in March that they were currently experiencing significant strain on their IT resources as a result of the outbreak. Another 14% told us that they expected to seek significant strain within three months. Well, now, we have 66% of organizations that have told us that they either did experience that strain with the outbreak or are still experiencing it currently. Still 41% telling us that they're currently experiencing uh, problems with making sure that IT is available and performing as expected in order to meet the current demands uh, arising from uh, the coronavirus outbreak. 25% said that they did experience those, but they're dealing better with them now. But another 31% tell us that, uh, another another few percentage uh, tell us that they uh, will expect uh, expect to continue to experience these uh, problems. But the number that don't expect to experience continues to shrink. And we'll be revisiting this survey again in August to see how those percentages have changed uh, with another two months in the rear rear view mirror at that time. Because of how organizations have had to invest to respond to the pandemic. We have seen organizations make investments primarily uh, to enable, first of all, 
the ability for employees working remotely to connect and collaborate. So that's been the area where we've seen the most significant increase in investment over the last couple of months. Um, overall, uh, we've seen organizations invest in mobile devices and services like laptops, phones, remote connectivity to enable people to work from home and work in these remote settings. But the area where we've re and bandwidth and network capacity, we've seen those increase as well too uh, over the course of the last few months. But the one area where the increase in spending has grown the most between March and June has been in the area of information security software and tools. So it's not just enabling the access and enabling the capability to connect and work remotely from home. It's the ability to assure that access, to make sure that it's secured, to make sure that the organization is protected. And the interesting thing about the lag in spending and, and the increase from March to June is that this is not uncommon. When organizations are presented with a crisis, yes, they have to meet the immediate requirements of making sure that resources are available, available and performing as expected. Security is often an afterthought, and it doesn't need to be that way because when organizations don't take security into account as they're making, as they're having to adapt to these radical changes, they can find themselves more exposed than they may have realized, and that can create problems for them down the line. So we do see organizations now waking up to the realization that yes, they do have to invest to make sure that they are secure because of the changes that they're having to make in response to the pandemic. So this is hardly surprising. Where are they having to invest? Where should they be looking? Well, Katie will get into this in some detail as far as the perspective from uh, the service provider and what one neck is seeing in particular in terms of how organizations can and should be adapting to these changes. But just to kind of survey some of the key areas that we see here at 451 Research that organizations tell us that they're looking at is first of all, securing not even the remote endpoint, but the end user. You have to keep in mind that one of the primary ways that attackers seek to target an organization is to target individuals and to target them through things like their susceptibility to phishing messages, their, their need for immediate help and support. So targeting email is a way to get messages to the end user that make it appear that they're going to be helped quickly by programs to help support people in need as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And they're going to unfortunately use that to manipulate people into executing attacks because of uh, the need or the expectation is so great. Organizations telling their people what changes need to be made and directing them to where to click to find more information about those essential changes. But a lot of times those messages can be spoofed uh, and are fraudulent and can induce people to do things that they would not do ordinarily because they need that information and what they've actually done is launched an attack. The local connection as well too. We see individuals connecting from home networks that oftentimes are not as well secured as the enterprise network can be. And resources are often shared on these home networks. Someone who's working on a work laptop, for example, may be sharing the same network with family members who are gaming. Uh, maybe on the same network uh, with your uh, a smart exercise device, which is connected in real time with others who are exercising with you on a treadmill or a bicycle, for example. You may be sharing the same network without knowing it, and these devices may be able to share information and content between them as well, too. Making sure that connection is secure end-to-end -end, from the remote endpoint all the way into the organization extends all the way to that endpoint, making sure security extends all the way to that endpoint and that those connections to the enterprise network are secure. And speaking of that network, you want to make sure that access is validated, access to sensitive enterprise resources is not only as expected, but under the right criteria, under the right terms, that someone is connecting, if they're connecting from a home network, as opposed to, let's say, a, a coffee shop or a public network that may not be as secure. The steps are taken to protect the enterprise against that sort of exposure. And once the connection is established, to make sure that it's used as expected. In other words, monitoring for activity that could be suspicious. That's not to say that users necessarily will act suspiciously, but if they're targeted, an attacker may be taking advantage of the fact that they're connected to the enterprise network to attempt to further penetrate into that network for a specific objective. 
one of the ways that we've seen organizations begin to embrace a stronger approach towards authentication, for example, is to further embrace this concept of zero trust. And essentially what that means is rather than simply trusting that when someone uh, presents a username and a password, that those credentials alone are sufficient to assure that this is who they claim to be. This is a legitimate user. They have the right password. Therefore, they should be admitted to the network. And as we all know, credentials can be readily compromised by attackers and used against a targeted organization. Are there other criteria that we can call upon so that when someone or something seeks access to the enterprise network that we can validate that they are in fact legitimate, that they can demonstrate that legitimacy through a number of factors that are introduced, such as two-factor authentication, uh, a second uh, password that's used just at, within a short period of time to verify uh, that that individual is uh, legitimate and authorized to connect to specific resources. Uh, what about the context of the network? Are they connecting from, from the network as expected? Is it as a, at a time of day and from a location as expected? Are they accessing resources that are expected? Does the behavior after connection, as mentioned before, does that look like the sort of behavior we would expect this individual to exhibit in connecting to the enterprise network? So taking those factors together to better prove, if you will, that access is legitimate and is being used legitimately after it's established, rather than simply trusting that a username or password is correct or trusting that connecting from a given network or a given VPN means that access is legitimate. Putting these together to better demonstrate that access is, can be relied upon. These are really what is meant by this concept of zero trust and is one of the areas where we see organizations investing uh, for better assurance of access to sensitive enterprise resources. Now, uh, once the endpoint is secured, once the network is secured, and once access can be assured, what about at the target itself? Well, not just validating authentication, but also fine-grained authorization that accessing only specific resources under specific conditions, which may include time of day, uh, access from specific location, and so on, that those privileges are constrained. Administrative or supervisory access is only limited to certain conditions. And again, monitoring for legitimate as well as suspicious activity and responding accordingly. In fact, throughout a security strategy, making sure that uh, sensitive content is given the appropriate protection end-to-end -end from the endpoint all the way through the, tar through the target and throughout its life cycle, making sure that the organization is aware of the threats that it faces uh, in detail and knowing how best to respond to those threats uh, the integration not only of monitoring but alerting so that the organization can respond in the event that uh, compromise is attempted and the ability to respond uh, with the right response and the right level of response when those situations arise. And finally, making sure that the organization's people are aware, are aware of how to operate in a secure manner, that they're aware of the nature of risky activity, of things that could expose not only the organization but themselves to risk, type of threats that they should and can be aware of, making sure that that awareness is consistently presented to people uh, so that they know how to inter interact with IT responsibly and securely. These are things which constitute a comprehensive security program and must be considered in detail over time, not only in response to this current pandemic, but as a long-term strategy and to help organizations with that uh, and to help organizations better be aware of how service providers can help them uh, deal with these uh, uh, contingencies. I'm going to turn our webcast now over to my friend Katie McCullough, who will talk about the one neck point of view on this. So Katie, take it away. Thanks, Scott. So I hope to build on all the great data Scott just shared on how we've been helping customers through uh, this unprecedented event. So what we saw even before uh, this all happened, um, starting in, in March of this year for us, um, is that securing the remote workforce was already top of mind for our customers when it when it came to you know security practices and how they were thinking about their environment. So obviously, as Scott noted, you know, within days and weeks, this grew exponentially with most companies having over 80% of their um, 
coworkers work from home. For one neck ourselves, while we're prim primarily a, a work remote workforce, um, we were probably at 50 percent. We went to nearly 100 percent. We do have data center technicians that are considered essential, and we're uh, still making the commute and still today are making that commute every day to take care of our customers. But so much of what we saw in, in those weeks um, as all this started to, to take hold is a lot of capacity issues, right, with licensing, bandwidth, um, even compute resources, right? Um, uh, there weren't just supply issues with uh, supply chain issues with toilet paper. It came down to some hardware access. And so companies were looking at how they were uh, leveraging different services to meet the needs that they now had with this remote workforce. And so, so many of our customers had that experience and we want to talk through how we help with help them through those efforts. And that ultimately, you know, it was a, a push on their IT teams um, to do things react very quickly. And when you're doing that, right, it's that's when um, things can get overlooked and that hopefully when you uh, work closely with, with experts that have done certain things in the in the past, you can assure some of that security and hopefully that's um, what I can get across today to you guys as well. And really expanding on the, the points that Scott was just ending with, with those key themes about securing endpoints, securing the network, sharing the systems that you're uh, targeting into for uh, certain services are secure and then the overall uh, overarching throughout your environment and security posture, assuring you've got the right things in place. So let's talk about the challenge, right, what we saw. Now, again, so many companies had remote workforce in place. Um, that's not a surprise, right, and systems were um, available to, to get remote. You know, a lot of times you had a remote workforce that um, grew over time, so there wasn't this just rush to train. Um, and certainly not a rush for capacity. A lot of the remote workers were already uh, fairly technically savvy, right? So you have a certain base. Um, you certainly had some collaboration tools in place. Um, you had some multi-factor. And definitely those VPNs are secure gateways that help to, to, help to encrypt or um, through multi-factor allow access into those corporate resources. And then COVID hit, right? And now we're talking about the vast majority of the workforce, like literally in days and in, in weeks moving into that remote workforce. So again, people that certainly hadn't done, done it before, weren't all that tech, technical savvy, um, but leveraging the tools and infrastructure you already had in place um, came with certainly some capacity and expansion needs. Um, and then ultimately, there were going to be situations where those employees were asked to use uh, even personal devices, certainly their own home networks to make that access. And again, dealing with some capacity around uh, that funnel of, of the VPN and secure gateways where all these uh, employees were going to be coming into. So we're going to hit on a lot of these points in some of the scenarios um, I'm going to talk through. But two key themes I, I want to reinforce is the fact that, you know, we're going to be asked to act very quickly when it comes to um, IT, right? And, and we need to do that as secure as possible. So how do we start with security as design? Scott mentioned this as well. But then how do you look also at your overall security program so that when situations come up like this, you don't feel like you're exposing yourself uh, instantly that you've got some just base controls in place. So we'll talk about security by design and we'll talk a little bit about um, you know, more of that risk management and how you're looking at security in your environment. So we're going to start with uh, security by design, right? And I look at this as simple as what's your checklist, right? What are the things you're going to make sure you understand about a new system or service that you're putting in place, right? Get the business folks together, a couple key business folks. Get the, um, if it's a service outside of your own a control, right, get the folks together to understand what data is going to go there um, and, and just the amount of data, right, because that introduces different risk if it's confidential versus regulated, if it's a few records versus hundreds of thousands of records of data, right, have some assessment of that. And then ultimately, you know, a, a key thing, especially if you're venturing into a new type of service, understand those configuration issues that you might run into, leverage experts to, 
that have done those configurations, especially if you're asking, being asked to do it in a very timely fashion, right? And then have a validation checklist, right? Go back 30 days, even 60 days to make sure things like these systems are being patched, right? We're getting backups on those systems and that you're seeing the people actually log into it or access it that you would expect to. I realize all this takes time, but just have, you know, a short checklist that you're asking those questions for security by design at the beginning and then doing some validation after it goes live. Um, as an example, we had a customer in the medical industry who they had, you know, typically about 25 employees that were working from home, but again, in a short amount of time, they had to have enable 200 of their employees to be able to work from home. Again, this was a medical uh, company, so they had to be concerned about HIPAA and the PHI data that they were going to be dealing with in those scenarios where now employees were at their home networks um, in, in connecting in and in, in getting to this data. And while they had secure systems, again, initially for those 25 folks, uh, the capacity wasn't going to be there, and they didn't run into supply chain issues with being able to get the hardware. Uh, we worked with them to implement a um, a cloud solution that would allow them to do what they want to do in a very secure fashion. And again, since we had experience, and this wasn't the first time we were doing it, we were able to look for, you know, traps that could happen. We, we see it, you know, in a situation where additional access gets put in place that was completely unintended when you're going into a cloud service, right? So you've got to know um, where those pitfalls will be. And if you're doing something in a very urgent matter, I uh, highly recommend you use people that have done it before and plus that allows for your IT experts to be focused on more things that are business critical um, for what's transpiring with your company in that moment. So security by design, in incredibly important to keep top of mind um, as you're introducing a new service and or system. As Scott said, if, if you if you um, think about it up front, you're going to save yourself a lot of pain and effort after the fact. So a little bit bigger topic um, is the, the, the overall security um, approach and in, in that you take as a company. And for us, and when we're talking to customers about how they view security, we take a very strong approach with risk management, right? Because there are going to be um, critical services to your business, critical data that has to be secured. And while Scott's um, information showed there, there is going to be an increased spend in IT and security, but we still aren't going to get all the money we want, right? And so you've got to be able to prioritize the, the, your, your own personal IT resources and your own IT budget on where you're going to focus um, your security practices. And the best way to do that is from a risk management standpoint. And again, there's a lot of great frameworks out there that can help you. You don't have to create it by yourself. Um, and depending on your industry, there might be one that makes more sense, whether it's ISO or NIST. For us at One Neck and for what we do when we consult with our customers, we actually use the Center for Internet Security um, Critical Se Security Controls Framework because it allows, um, it it's really can be relevant to pretty much any industry and it's very security focused. Um, it's a concise list of 20 controls uh, and, and it just helps you prioritize right out of the gate. Um, so again, for ourselves, we look at this um, for how we do our services, and then we consult and work with customers to assess their own risk management concerns based on their services and their data. And again, when you have a situation like we saw with COVID where you have so many workforce uh, coworkers go remote in, in a short amount of time, the more you've got um, those controls in place and at least understand where you may have some gaps, it's going to be easier in the moment in dealing with urgent situations to know where your risk may have just grown exponentially. So I won't go very deep into this because this is the critical security controls. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with it. But again, this is a prioritized list of security controls. Um, it does change at times. It's got a worldwide base of experts that are con constantly assessing the threats out there and adjusting these priorities. Uh, you don't see it a lot, but on occasion there will be some changes in how they prioritize things. However, um, 
the, the basic goal in these is if you start addressing these controls uh, from top to bottom, the more and more secure you come in your environment. And as an example, they have research to show if you implement the, the t just the top six controls, they address over 80% of the threats that are out there. And, and similar to a lot of the data being collected right since that March timeframe, they are certainly seeing over a 26% increase in cyber attacks since uh, COVID started. A lot of those are in that phishing realm, right? Because again, they know those end users are hungry for information about what's going on and are easily, unfortunately, manipulated to looking at sites that maybe they wouldn't normally have looked at just looking for those, uh, that new information. Um, so just one example, and again, I'm going to get into a few of the controls that I viewed um, were very, very focused at a remote workforce. But as an example, right, the, the second control in there is the inventory and control of software, right? So if you know what software your users are using, guess what? You can, you can control the security around it. And one of the, the big things that grew exponentially with all the work from home was the collaboration tools. Right, and there were so many variations, so many use cases required from just the day-to-day -day use, right? How are you interacting with uh, your own team members to, hey, we're gonna have a board meeting, which requires uh, folks outside the, the company uh, to engage together in a collaboration to an all event, right? All company event. And there are absolutely, um, you know, uh, tools that help with with all those scenarios, but how you configure those uh, for individual meetings um, and individuals that may or may not be within your company all takes consideration. And again, if you're rushed into doing that, um, sometimes you're not always looking at uh, does this data you know, need to be encrypted? What are we talking about, right? Um, board materials can be a lot more sensitive than just some of the day-to-day -day collaborations you might have. Um, and, and so, the configuration of that software is very important in the education to your users um, as, you know, there was a lot of press around certain uh, collaboration tools not, and it wasn't that they didn't have some of the security features, it's that they, you know, individuals didn't, weren't aware of them and how to enable them. So again, all these controls are very important, uh, but it's a prioritized list. Uh, it's a framework that is very near and dear to our heart just for how we live and breathe. And again, um, what we use when we go out and talk to customers about what their security needs are. So what I'll do now is I'm just going to dive into five of the controls that I think are most relevant to when we are talking about um, security for the remote for workforce. So the first control I'm going to dive into a little bit is logging. So uh, while most companies have monitoring for IT services, they aren't always watching for security events and they certainly can have limited coverage, um, not 24 by 7 to react to those alerts. So what this control speaks to, right, do you have a tool, st tool set available to and configured to not only understand what those security events might be, but do you also have the staff to respond to it? What, what we've seen historical, right, is bad actors get into your environment and they can dwell for weeks, months, even year to understand the landscape and to understand where your interesting data is. And so the sooner you can identify them in any suspicious activity, obviously the sooner you can respond and, and, and address that, that malicious or even suspicious activity. Uh, at OneNet, we partner with AlertLogic, and when you pair that with our managed services, uh, AlertLogic's monitoring detection and response solution, which is a platform that not only provides, you know, the security uh, event monitoring, but it also uh, packages that with a 24 by 7 security operations center. And then with our managed services, you know, we're able to respond 24 by 7 to any kind of uh, events that might be certainly suspicious and definitely malicious in your environment to be able to address them very quickly. Um, as a recent example, right, we've had a, we had a customer that uh, saw a sudden increase spike in DNS requests, and the customer wasn't aware of that, but that was an event that was triggered within uh, our Alert Logic MDR. Uh, the SOC analyzed that that traffic and determined that over a hundred of the company's hosts, including a lot of remote hosts, were communicating to known malware control, command and control systems. They were able to identify those source IPs that could be blocked. 
and with first, further investigation, right, they found they mowed it. Um, malware, which again is a polymorphic trojan, so it is not going to be caught by traditional um, signature-based AV. So through all those, uh, through that monitoring, they were able to identify it, quickly react, right, because otherwise it could have been one of those things that would have been in the environment for, for weeks, getting intel about the environment and then targeting specific data that might be very confidential or even regulated to that customer. Uh, moving on to the next control, in terms of, you know, this is kind of an easy way, <laughs> easy one. I think we all know we've got to have a malware defense, right, especially on those remote devices. But not all mal anti-malware and uh, malware defenses are the same, right? So uh, years ago, right, it was signature based. And while there's been some evolution on that, um, you got to make sure that your endpoint protection includes that more behavioral based analysis um, because unfortunately these bad guys uh, are smart and they're going to figure out how to, to move around those signatures and create new variants. Um, so you've got to have uh, an endpoint protection that can trigger on more behavioral events than just looking for a certain signature. So OneNeck itself has worked with numerous customers to implement uh, Cisco AMP, which provides that additional um, Endpoint, it provides that endpoint protection, but then also additional threat detection capabilities um, that can zero in on when they're seeing behaviors that aren't typical for an end user. Uh, we also have customers leveraging AlertLogic's endpoint protection, which comes packaged with their MDR solution. Uh, again, both provide that behavioral uh, analysis. Um, so as an example, we had a customer um, who didn't have uh, next generation endpoint protection, but they kept seeing an odd situation on a few of their remote devices where they would just randomly blue screen and they didn't understand why. They had all this telemetry, they were trying to figure it out. They thought it was a bug in their, in their, in their code. Uh, we stepped in and, and implemented uh, the next generation endpoint solution and it instantly identified a malicious PowerShell script, um, script that even though the remote devices had had antivirus on it, it was not triggering um, because it was, uh, it was seen as a normal activity through PowerShell. So again, uh, can't speak enough to getting malware defenses on all of your systems and making sure they can handle more of those behavioral uh, situations and not just signature based. So the next topic is the boundary defense, right? And it's just been mentioned and, and Scott had several slides to show how the band boundary on all of our networks are growing exponentially. And that they're just new scenarios to understand with connecting to cloud and SaaS based solutions. But I think the other thing is to look at it as an opportunity to educate your employees even on good home practices, right? They, they've all got their internet connection at home. Right, and it, it wouldn't. It not only helps uh, our customers and our companies when we, our our coworkers practice best practices, but it's also going to help them just as end users uh, in what they do today, day to day. Right, just educate them, uh, ask them to make sure they work with their vendors that their hardware is up to date and that they use strong password password protections. Right, that they're changing the password on their. Um, modems and routers, whatever they have at home, and that where they can use MFA, um, that, that they're selecting that as an option. But the reality is companies have to look at their boundaries differently with all those scenarios, as, as Scott pointed out. We had a, a customer who, again, in, in this situation, they had a need to have portable phones um, for several hundred of their employees. And they had a configuration that had been working again for a small number, um, but when they turned it on for, for the several hundred, they found that um, in particular it was for, you know, the portable phones and to do some collaboration that it just, it was not working scalably. And so we, we came in and really identified that they needed a specialized device for that boundary. So not only would it, it deal with the capacity, but it actually made the 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 end user expense experience much simpler. And what we will always find with security, right, is the simpler you can in, 
uh, put security match with end user experience, the more likely they're going to use it, and they are not going to be finding ways to go around it. So, again, it was a, a, a boundary item that we had experience with, so we knew how to configure it and educate the customer on the management going forward so that they could assure that boundary is kept secure going forward. So the next topic, and again, uh, something Scott hit on, is um, the fact that you've got to keep your your employees educated. And it's not just a few random emails, right? It's talking to business unit leaders and um, talking to the business unit leaders and making sure that they're helping communicate um, what we saw through all this, right, is there was so much information coming out from certainly as companies tried to communicate to their employees, and it, it, it did get jumbled, right? And, and the bad guys are opportunists, right? They knew if they labeled something with COVID, they had a you know, pretty good shot at somebody clicking on something. And so in these moments, right, you have to educate your employees on what communications are going to be coming from the company and, and reinforce what that communication is going to be looking, uh, looking like with the folks that are interacting more closely with your individual employees like managers and business units so that they can um, help reinforce that message and assure that those messages are legitimate. So again, it's not just a few random emails. It's a constant drumbeat of information coming from different areas of the business led by the security team, but um, making sure that message can be delivered in multiple avenues. And again, it's just an opportunity to help employees uh, be educated about their own personal uses, which is always going to help the, the, the greater company need as well. Um, another you know, great tip is uh, as more and more of your employees were using cam cameras, right? You can teach them how to turn those darn things off uh, so they don't risk some embarrassing moments as well. But highly encourage folks to do their own phishing testing campaign, right? This is going to signify who are more susceptible. And, you know, if it's a, it can be a targeted phishing campaign that looks at things like, you know, sending out a budget email during your budgeting cycle, right? But those are so critical to build awareness and to understand where you've got weak spots where you can do some additional training. So end user uh, awareness and training is, is very critical in a situation like this. And then the last control I'll talk about, and again, Scott mentioned it, incidents are going to happen, right? Whether there's a small contained incident on somebody's workstation or it's a more endemic situation where you've got all your servers potentially exposed to ransomware, right? Again, it comes back to the same concept we talked about with security by de design. Have a checklist, right? Just, just know the 10 things, the 20 things you're going to do um, certainly more in that endemic situation, right? What data are you going to collect? What, do you, what um, you know, user access lists are you going to look at, right? Just have a list of things that you're going to look at to assure you're um, getting to the actual um, root cause of what is causing that, that situation. And, and don't get in a situation where you react, react too quickly. We've seen this with customers where they try to go right into recovery mode. They haven't addressed the root issue, and it, uh, the bad guys come right back within days. So spend a little time documenting what your response is going to be in those situations. And again, would highly encourage folks to even keep Pull in key folks for one to two hours and just do a tabletop exercise, right? Walk through a few scenarios, talk about who's going to be involved. Again, these are, these are services OneNeck does frequently with their customers where we either work with them to implement a, an incident response plan. We also have services where you can work with us on a retainer basis so that if something more endemic does have it happen in your environment, OneNeck can holistically step in and help with those situations. Or we can help facilitate even a tabletop exercise. So all those are, are critical elements in a situation like this. So to recap just a little bit, um, you know, we're all going to be asked to react quickly to new, to new situations. Uh, COVID just showed that in spades, right? And, and the more secure practices you have in place, the more you will be assured when you have to react quickly um, that you can do that. And again, where you have to react quickly, 
go back to checklists, go back to people that have done it before um, so that you are um, controlling your risk exposure to your own environment. Scott, I'll open it back up to, to you guys and some questions. Thanks, Katie. That was uh, some great guidance and input and speaking from experience as well, too. And that experience was definitely valuable at a time when people really need it. And particularly when it extends across a number of organizations, you have some visibility into what uh, what organizations are doing consistently and what works for them. And I think that can be very valuable uh, to people who have these questions. And speaking of questions, I think we probably have some questions from our live uh, webinar audience. So, Kristen? I'm going to turn it over to you to see what we've got uh, in the queue that uh, people might want to have us take a shot at. Sounds great. And we do have a few questions that we'll try to get through here. So um, first one up, if remote work is going to be long term, are you saying we should stop turning up VPN just to get our people on a secure network and better invest elsewhere? And if so, where? Ah, uh, yes, that's a question we've been getting a response to. This. <laughs> This presentation that talks about, you know, VPN has its problems and it's under strain, but what are the alternatives? And for security purposes, if the alternative is to have uh, remote users connecting directly to third-party services without any visibility or control on the part of security uh, for the organization, that's not necessarily a very good thing either. But we are seeing the landscape changing in terms of what's available and capable uh, for that. So. There's a number of ways that people can uh, connect to third-party resources without necessarily connecting with them directly, but even when they connect directly, they have to keep in mind that a lot of these services do provide monitoring and visibility for their customers and for their customers, security administrators and analysts. Uh, there's a lot of connectivity solutions that can provide secure connectivity between endpoints and these targets and can consolidate that connectivity as well as provide security functionality uh, at the same time. There's a lot of intelligence that can be gathered from endpoints, but oftentimes these have to be woven together, and sometimes the security technology providers are not quite there yet. So, so two things. You shouldn't say no to turning up VPN if you, need, if you need the availability and the access for your people, and that's your first line of defense, then yes, it's certainly an option for you. But as Katie was saying, and Katie, I invite you to comment on this, you really do have to plan this systematically. You have to prioritize, make your investments that you need to, to for today, but don't forget where this is going to be taking you tomorrow and what long-term benefit you expect to see from the investments you're making today. Best to do that is a strategic process and evaluate your needs today against your needs that you see shaping up in the future. And Katie, I'm sure you've got a lot of experience you'd like to reflect on this based on what you've seen across your clients. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So yeah, I mean, it does come down to there are certainly going to be new methods to connect uh, beyond the VPN, and we've got to embrace those methods because um, they can be cheaper. Now they have to be more secure. They're just as secure, right? And it is when when you get into those configurations, Right, you can still apply your same best practices. Right, is our is data encrypted? Is uh, are we requiring multi-factor? Right, and um, and what does that configuration look like? It, can we still scan it to make sure it's secure? Right, it doesn't mean you move away from your security practices. It just means you need to apply it in a different way. And again, if you're having to do something in a very um, quick manner, making sure that you get guidance and don't um, just have to refer back to the manual, right? Yeah, and as far as uh, technology providers, we're seeing you know people moving from on-premises approaches to secure web gateway to cloud web gateway, cloud secure web gateway. Uh, some of these have been in play for some years already, but we're also seeing new entrants in those spaces like uh, web content delivery networks uh, because they have highly distributed points of presence. Even the cloud providers themselves, and certainly service providers and IT service providers like OneNeck are, are able to provide uh, this capability directly for their customers, as well as provide the security monitoring and management functionality as well. So you have a lot of options to choose from. Uh, worth investigating now because you'll certainly be needing them for some time to come if you're like many businesses having to enable significantly expanded secure remote access. Kristen, what else do we have in the queue? Great, yeah, I think we have time to do one more. So 
here's the next question. We're a smaller organization and feel we get the security controls and visibility we need from our existing SaaS and cloud resources. Do we really need to invest further considering how expensive security can be? <laughs> security can be expensive if you don't invest in it because the fallout and the after effects of incidents that you not, not well prepared for can be far more expensive than your investment in security to say the least. So, but uh, yes, there are a lot of services that do provide security functionality as part of their package or, or natively with uh, their functionality. However, the number of services that organizations are adopting is going to start complicating the management of all of them. If they all have a different approach to management, if they all have a different way to gain visibility into what they do, that places a burden on your own people. And Katie, you've been seeing this, I'm sure, for all your clients. How do they get this together? How do they bring some consistency? And how can a service provider uh, like OneNeck help them uh, with that really fragmented challenge? Yeah, Scott, to your point, there's going to be plenty of data out there and plenty of providers that that can help folks look at the data. I know for ourselves, you know, we deal more and more um, with customers in, in the HyperCloud with Azure. And so looking at certainly some of the tools, yep, they come, uh, they come as part of the service, but interpreting those tools and what, they, and what the readouts are for what that business need is can still be challenging, right? Um, so having a security background to interpret that information and what, what it might mean for your whole corporate network and not just that one uh, device in, in, the, in Azure um, can make a big difference. And that's the kind of experience that OneNet can bring to the table um, in interpreting that data, not just from a narrow lens, but from a full uh, IT ecosystem lens. Great. And Kristen, I think you were saying that's all we have time for. So if you want to go ahead and wrap us up for uh, wrap yeah. us up for us today, and to our audience, thank you very much for joining us. Great. Well, thank you so much, Scott and Katie, as well. And as a reminder, the on-demand version of this webinar will be available shortly. So on behalf of OneNeck IT Solutions and 451 Research, thank you for attending, and have a great day. <laughs>